A Basis for Choice Our analysis of death is part of our search for a complete ontological description of being in the world. Mortality often seems to be an insuperable obstacle to grasping the ontological structure of human existence as a single unified whole. But our analysis demonstrates that understanding our mortality is actually a precondition for any individual to attain existential integrity. Our existence can become genuinely individual and whole only by seeing death ontologically as an ever-present impossible possibility that makes the possible impossibility of our existence inevitable. Our whole discussion so far has been leading up to this topic because choice, as we have discussed, is the central point in integrity, in individuality, in exercising our free will and becoming an authentic human being in the full sense of the term. In general, care for the world and the things in the world is an inadequate basis for choice. It always leaves us at the effect of external factors. And in that way, we can never attain integrity or authenticity. Our discussion of death shows that the awareness of impending death provides a basis for integrity because it gives us a qualitative standard for identifying those possibilities that are uniquely our own. It also shows that choosing for the world is completely inauthentic because the world as a whole never shows up in our clearing, only the objects and persons in the world. And if we do choose for the world, it robs us of our self-determination, energy, attention, and authenticity because we can never be completely ourselves. Integrity, the unity and wholeness of essentially finite enigmatic beings and their endeavors, has both a theoretical and an existential significance. Integrity is not just a fundamental quality of good phenomenological analysis, but the keynote of an authentic relation to both death and life. Integrity is required for authentic being. Without being a whole person, without being a human being in the full sense of the term, with all the functions and activities and qualities of a human being, then we don't have integrity, and so how can we be authentic? Integrity is the subject of one of our advanced courses, where we go into the definition of integrity and how to maintain one's integrity in great detail. Now, we don't use the typical normative virtue model of integrity based on right and wrong, good and bad in various domains. We use a positive model of integrity and we will discuss that uh, or we will present that rather in uh, part seven in the conclusions. And uh, as I said, we go into that model in great detail in our advanced courses. We define integrity not as a moral quality or virtue, but as the state or condition of being whole, complete, unbroken, unimpaired, sound, in perfect condition. When our human beingness is in perfect condition, complete and whole, unbroken, unimpaired and sound, we have integrity. But for that, we have to recover our authentic being. We have to be the unique individual that we are, without compromising with the world. Our emphasis on integrity or wholeness may appear arbitrary, but it is not. Surely, acknowledging one's own mortality includes accepting death as a present threat to our existence. It highlights that what is at stake is not just the content of any given moment, but the entire course of that life taken as a whole. If the quality of our entire life is at stake in our everyday existential choices, 
How can we choose to make our life into a single integral whole? Should seeing our individual life choices in the context of our entire life demand that we should aim for narrative unity? Would it not be equally authentic to include as many different activities, achievements, and modes of life as possible before death intervenes? It's not just the present moment or the choices or possibilities that are before us now that matters. Our life as a whole matters. To have completion and integrity, to have authentic being, the quality of our whole life is at stake in each of our choices. Each of our choices has to contribute to our life as a whole and be seen in the context of our life as a whole. And of course, that means in the presence of impending death. Our phenomenological analysis reveals that our human life and activities comprise an unbreakable unity. We are the same person that is born from the womb in the beginning of our life, and we are the same person who dies at the end of our life. So we need a basis for choice that gives us access to the unity and completeness of our existence. And the question is, if we simply choose based on our personal preferences, desires, habits, or inclinations, uh, then should we aim for a consistent set of choices, or should we choose as many different varieties of experiences as we can to try to have a complete experience of human beingness? We distinguish our ontological account of authenticity from traditional philosophy. Our idiosyncratic use of ethical religious concepts like integrity, guilt, and conscience might seem to align our ideas with normative concepts of morality and ethics in religion and theology. However, we view integrity as a purely positive realm, defined as the state or condition of being whole, complete, unbroken, sound, in perfect condition. We can be authentic only to the degree that we possess integrity. Now, this diagram shows our model of integrity as a positive value. Integrity as a positive value has the advantage of being measurable. We can measure how much integrity or what percentage of integrity a person has by how well they honor their word. And we go into this in great detail in the integrity course. Philosophy and theology, a traditional view, is that integrity is a normative value. And uh, indeed, there are normative values of integrity in the uh, moral or social domain, in the organizational and governmental domain. But then the question arises, whose morality, which ethics, and what country's legality we should use as the standard for integrity? Because these things uh, give us the measure of integrity, they should be consistent, but they're not. It's the only consistent measure of integrity that we can find to answer the question, how much integrity do we possess, is it only answerable when we consider integrity as a positive value. It's just like saying, how much money do you have? It's measurable, it's quantifiable. The traditional view is that human beings continuously confront the question of choosing how we should live. So we must identify some standard or set of values to guide our choices. Moreover, if that standard is used to inform all our choices, it adds significance to our whole life. If each choice is made by reference to the same standard, the life that grows from that series of choices will manifest an underlying unity. The question of what gives meaning to one's life as a whole makes the same conjunction between authenticity and wholeness that we propose in our analysis. At this point, traditional philosophy goes on to suggest a religious answer to the question of life's meaning. But is that really necessary, 
or would it be an arbitrary superimposition of values? So again, if we use an external standard to determine the quality of our choices, if it comes from theology, which theology? Or what religion? Or whose culture are we using as the standard? And these questions cannot be resolved because they are a matter of individual conditioning, cultural embeddedness, and taste. When we look at it from an ontological point of view, any system of choice based on an external standard means caring about the other more than about ourselves. And when we do that, we compromise our integrity, we lose our authenticity, and we also lose uh, an objective, measurable, concrete, positive standard against which we can measure our integrity. The values based on external standards reduce our integrity because we become fragmented. We become split between our interests and the interests of the world. And the interests of the world are manifold and mutually contradictory and conflicting. This reduces our integrity, and reduced integrity reduces freedom, energy, intelligence, and ability. In other words, our productivity, our creativity, our energy, and our attention all are reduced by fragmentation, and we become much less productive than we are when we are whole. How do we choose? Suppose that we begin by aiming at a specific goal or achievement to give our life meaning, the pursuit of power or wealth, the development of a talent. Such goals have significance only because we desire them. In this view, our individual wants and inclinations are the source of the meaning of our life. But such dispositions can alter. Our tastes and desires may change. This means that no desire or disposition can add meaning or value to my life as a whole. Our desires may change or disappear, but the question of how to live our life remains for as long as we are alive. Staking our life upon temporary changing desires deprives it of meaning. This view actually shows that the foundation of my life is not whatever desires I happen to have, but my capacity to choose among them. According to traditional philosophy, we can avoid self-deception only by explicitly grounding our lives on our capacity to choose, transforming the conditional array of our desires into unconditional values. For example, we might moderate our sexual impulses by choosing an unconditional commitment to marriage, or commit to a certain vocation on the basis of a talent. We thereby choose not to permit changes in contingent factors to alter the shape of our lives. This constancy maintains the unity and integrity of our lives, regardless of fluctuations in the intensity of our desires, thereby creating a self for ourselves from ourselves. So then traditional philosophy goes a step further and says, well, if choice is what gives meaning to our life, then we should make a choice to commit to something greater than ourselves. That way, uh, the meaning of our life will become stable because now it's not depending on our changing whims and tastes. But there's some external measurable standard that how well did we maintain our commitment to something greater that, that like a relationship, a group, a cause, a religion, a philosophy, and so on. Well, that is a base, better basis for choice than our individual tastes, but it's still external. That means it will still fragment us and diminish our integrity because a created self, any kind of a self that we make for ourselves out of choices based on external factors will always be synthetic and therefore inauthentic. This version of the traditional understanding of the ethical life implies a second reason for connecting authenticity and wholeness. If authenticity amounts to establishing and maintaining genuine selfhood, 
The fluctuations of individual desires and dispositions cannot form an adequate basis for it. The resulting multiplicity of unrelated existential fragments would not cohere into a whole that we could claim as our own. But can holding unconditionally to a choice be an adequate source of life's meaning? The capacity to choose is still only a part of a person's life, but no part can give meaning to the whole of which it is a part. What justifies the capacity to choose as the basis of the meaning of our life? What gives choice its meaning? So traditional morality, commitment, let's say, uh, to a country, a, a political stance or school, uh, a religion, a philosophy, or some kind of cause that's greater than oneself, is also good, but because, again, choice is simply a part of who we are, the part cannot give meaning to the whole. Another point is that our choice can be arbitrary. The same person in a different circumstances might make a completely different choice, depending on the possibilities that are available in the external situation. So if choice is more or less arbitrary, what gives choice its meaning? And how can something that has no intrinsic meaning of its own give meaning to our entire existence? The question of the meaning of our whole life is not answerable in terms of any part of that life. Our life as a whole can acquire meaning only by relating it to something beyond it. Only such a transcendental standard could give a genuinely unconditional answer to the question of the meaning of one's life. Only by relating ourselves to such an absolute, relativizing the importance of the finite, can we properly answer the question existence poses. Such an absolute standard is, for traditional philosophy, just another name for God. We can relate properly to each moment of our existence only by relating our lives as a whole to God and submitting to the moral standards of religious life. Now, it's true that our life as a whole must derive meaning from something beyond it. But what is there that is greater than our life that also has the same quality as our existence and will not force us to reduce our integrity? Well, traditional philosophy suggests that God is this transcendental source of meaning, that God, by creating the scriptures, gives a certain standard of moral activity, right and wrong, and then we have to follow that standard, and when we do, our life is given its ultimate meaning by this external authority. So, this is traditional theological standard, uh, but the translation of that in the ontological terms is that you must submit to an external standard of morality based on ecclesiastical authority. It's still not experiential. It's still not ontological. It's still not phenomenological. It's still not based on our experience. And although it's something beyond us that has a similar quality to our being, it still translates down to an external standard. Our phenomenological analysis of death gains significance against this background. We accept the conjunction between authenticity and wholeness, but we show that this conjunction can be properly forged by relating appropriately to one's mortality. Thus, authenticity and integrity are obtainable without resorting to theology, to an absolute transcendental conception beyond our as-lived experience. By understanding death as our own most possibility and anticipating it in every existential choice we make, human beings can live authentic and integral lives without having to relate those lives to a transcendent deity or an arbitrary system of morality. So, we solve this problem in our analysis of our relation with death 
because we can relate our whole life to something that is beyond it, giving an adequate context for the meaning of the whole of our life, but that also shows up within it. And the only thing like that that we know so far is death. The authentic relation to death provides an absolute transcendental standard with which every choice in our life can be related. In other words, death has the same quality as the authentic possibilities that are completely our own. Uh, death is the own most. It's a non-relational standard. It's inevitable. And just like everyone has their own nature, their own taste, and their own style of doing things, or they should, death gives us an absolute standard with which to compare our choices and our possibilities to determine which ones are uniquely our own. So by relating our life as a whole to our death, this solves the problems of integrity and authenticity caused by requiring an external standard for choice. Because death shows up within our life as an authentic possibility, but it's also something that is beyond our existence. Certainly, the question of life's meaning is an inescapable part of human life. It can be properly understood only by acknowledging the contingency and finitude of our life. But acknowledging our finitude does not require comparison with an infinite, unconditioned realm or entity. Such a comparison implies that conditioned human life is a limitation rather than a limit, a set of constraints that deprive us of participation in a better mode of life rather than a set of conditions essential to determine the recognizably human form of any human life. The problem with comparing our choices to some transcendental, infinite standard that's viewed as outside of the world or outside of our existence is that it implies a limitation rather than a limit to our existence. It implies that we can never attain anything beyond our present finite being in the world. If you think about it, if God is so much higher and so much greater than our human existence, then how can we ever rise to that standard? Uh, it seems like an impossible thing. And this is why religious people remain stuck in inauthentic being. For one thing, they're taking a, a standard that's outside of their own selves as a requirement for their choices. And for another thing, they're taking the perfection of God as an unattainable standard because it's outside of the world in which we live. Our being is in the world, and as long as we're in the world, we're never going to be perfect. But we can uh, approach perfection by attaining integrity within ourselves. Without this integrity, religion and morality will always degenerate into ordinary being in the world. And we see this in so many cases where so-called religious authorities, priests and gurus and so on, start to act just like businessmen or politicians or ordinary people with ordinary desires and motives. And they lose whatever uh, purity or perfection they have because deep down they believe that they can never attain the standard Existential wholeness requires only an acknowledgement of human mortality, and only those forms of traditional theology that understand conditions as limits rather than limitations are compatible with a proper ontological understanding of human existence. A proper grasp of conditioned human existence does require relating it to something beyond its scope but it does not require that we relate it to some essentially unconditioned thing or being. The relevant context is not that of a transcendent deity, but non-existence or nothingness. Now, this doesn't mean that we advocate atheism or agnosticism. We don't. 
Actually, uh, we don't accept nihilism either, or nihilistic and impersonal forms of religion. But we do accept the forms of theology and spiritual life that do not conflict with the individual's freedom of choice and that provide an objective, measurable standard of integrity that an individual can live up to in their practical life without requiring them to surrender to some external standard. In other words, we are creating an experiential platform for theism. That means direct personal experience of the deity. And this experience can be had by anyone who is willing to go through the process of collecting their scattered parts of themselves from the world into an authentic, integral whole making choices based on their unique individuality and comparing them with, in the light of their mortality to their limitations, their finitude, the fact that they're going to die. And this opens up the possibility of a direct personal experience of God. And that is where we're going with this. That is what we want to help people attain. Recall a time when you chose fully for yourself. How did you feel? Recall a time when you chose for the other. How was that different? Do you use an external standard of choice? Which one? If you were to choose only for yourself, how would you choose differently? Get clear that integrity as a normative virtue is unmeasurable. Does your life as a whole have a meaning? What is it? Are you a religious person? How do you deal with the essential hypocrisy of religious morality? Over time, have you seen that you and others get better at following external standards of morality and choice? If so, or if not, why or why not? Recall a time in your life when you changed your desires. How did that affect your choices? Have you ever tried to be something you're not? How did it affect you?